So what we're going to do today is I'm going to teach you the respiratory physiology out of our Engage lab manual. I'm going to go over this information, show you where you need to be studying. And then we're going to, at, at the end of the class, we're going to go over how to calculate lung volumes. So there is a little experiment for this exercise, but we can't do it. You know, obviously we're not physically together and then we don't have the machine anyway, but I'm going to tell you what the, how all of that works when we get to the end. All right, so let's cover some of the basic functions of the respiratory system. All right, so you pretty much know that your respiratory system is involved in exchanging respiratory gases between the lungs and the blood. You breathe in, you breathe out, we kind of know that. And so we want to load the blood with oxygen. You're going to unload or remove carbon dioxide from the blood but the cardiovascular system is also involved with this. Obviously, it transports the respiratory gases around the body. And so we also have gas exchange at the tissue level, where the cells want to remove oxygen from the blood and use it to make ATP aerobically. And then they want to dump in their waste gas, which is CO2. So I'm going to show you a picture of that in one of my lecture PowerPoints here in a little while um, to explain what internal and external respiration is. But what are some other functions of the respiratory system, you know, besides the, the obvious, you know, uh, the exchange of respiratory gases? Well, when you breathe air in through your nose, the air hits the mucous membranes in the nasal cavities and it warms up the air. And by warming the air up, it actually helps inflate your lungs. So it's a little easier to breathe in warmer air than it is to breathe in cold air. I don't know if you've ever been out in the cold, like when it's really cold and you try to breathe in real deep through your mouth, it kind of hurts a little bit because colder air doesn't expand as well as warm air. So we warm the air up by breathing through our nose. It also moistens the air and helps filter and trap any dirt and debris that we might be breathing up and prevents it from going into the deeper parts of our respiratory system. We also are able to smell. You breathe up air through your nose, obviously you can smell. That's called olfaction. You learned about the cranial nerves in AMP1 and you probably remember cranial nerve number one is an olfactory nerve, right? So that's, that's smell. We also produce speech <clears throat> by manipulating air through our vocal cords. We can force more or less air through, we can speak louder, we can you know, manipulate our speech through our, our, our vocal cords, which is in our voice box. Our respiratory system is also involved in regulating blood pH. I'll mention a little bit about pH today, but we do have a whole exercise where, we, where we're gonna learn all about uh, pH regulation, and we're gonna learn about the four basic pH imbalances, primary pH imbalances in the very last lab that we do. But the respiratory system can help us at the organ level regulate blood pH. The kidneys are the other organs in the organ system that regulates pH at the organ level. And then the lungs are involved in at least helping regulate blood pressure because angiotensin II is produced by an enzyme that's located in the capillaries around parts of our lung around the alveoli. And that enzyme, if you remember, was angiotensin converting enzyme. So that renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the most important hormonal regulator of blood pressure in our body, is actually involving the respiratory system as well. Because that's the final place where angiotensin is gonna be activated to angiotensin II. Right? So these are just some of the other functions. Obviously, you know, you breathe in and out and exchange respiratory gases. So our respiratory system can be classified in two ways. There's a structural classification and there's a functional classification. Structurally, we have what's called upper and lower respiratory tracts. And so your upper respiratory tract includes your nose with your nasal cavity and your pharynx, which is your throat. 
So basically everything above your voice box, your larynx, is what we call our upper respiratory tract. But your lower respiratory tract includes everything from your larynx, which is the voice box, and deep, going all the way deep into your lungs. So that includes the larynx, your voice box, your windpipe, the trachea, all of the tubes that enter and then traverse the lungs, which are called the bronchial tubes, and then the deep parts of the lung itself, all the way down to what we call the alveoli, right? So that's upper and lower. Functionally, the respiratory system is classified as what we call conducting zone structures or respiratory zone structures. The conducting zone structures include all of the structures in the respiratory system where we have no gas exchange whatsoever. So no exchange of oxygen and no exchange of CO2. The conducting zone structures only conduct air in and out of the respiratory system. So there's no gas exchange. All of that those structures include your nose and your mouth, because you can breathe through your mouth, your pharynx, which is your throat, the trachea, the windpipe, and what's called the bronchial tree, the primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi, the bronchioles, something called terminal bronchioles. All of those tubes that carry the air into and out of your lungs are part of what we call the conducting zone structures or the conducting system. And then we have the structures where we exchange gases, O2 and CO2. And all of those structures are called respiratory zone structures, or they're part of what's called the respiratory portion of the respiratory system. And the structures involved in gas exchange include a small tube, or many of them really, called respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, and alveoli. These structures are the structures that are the deepest structures in our lungs, and those are the structures where we have gas exchange. You're going to notice some of these names on the models that you'll be studying in the Quizlets and out of my models book chapter, right? Also, the deepest part of our lung where we have the majority of our gas exchange, a layman's term for it, people call it an air sac. I hate using that term air sac though because we have a structure that has the name sac in it, alveolar sac. So I don't like using the layman's term, but the smallest little bulbular shaped structure where we have the majority of gas exchange occurring deep in our lung is called the alveoli. Singular would be alveolus. Now we have a couple of types of cells. I want you to know what those cells are um, that make up the alveolus. And the type one alveolar cells really are nothing more than simple squamous epithelial cells you learned about in AMP1. So the type one cells are the cells that make up the wall of the alveolus. Remember squamous cells are flat, right? So by these type one alveolar cells making up the whole wall of an alveolus and they're flat, there's, very, there's a very small space that the, ga the gases have to travel through. So it makes for a very quick and efficient diffusion of the gases during gas exchange since the cells are flat. Now, we also have a type two cell, the type two alveolar cell. These are cuboidal type cells that produce a product called surfactant. I'm gonna talk about surfactant in a second again. But surfactant is a solution of lipids and proteins um, and ions mixed in a little bit of water. 
And those type two cells secrete this fluid to the inside of the alveolus. So the very inside of the alveolus is not dry. There's a little bit of moisture in there, but we don't want there to only be water in there because if it's only a mixed, if it's only water, water is very cohesive, meaning the water molecules like to attract to each other very strongly. That's called surface tension. And if there's no surfactant in there, like in premature babies, the water molecules start to pull together and it makes the alveolus collapse down on itself. In lecture, I usually like to describe this in this fashion with this analogy. If you guys went and bought um, a bag of balloons and you pulled a balloon out, the, the edges of the balloon aren't stuck together, right? Because inside the balloon is a little bit of powder. It's all dry in there. But if you blow that balloon up several times and let the air out and blow it up and let the air out and blow it up, I don't know if you ever did that, but sooner or later, the little edges of the balloon start to stick together. That's because while you blow air into it, you're putting water vapor in there. And so the edges of the balloon stick together because the water is more attracted to itself and it pulls the edges together. Well, when that happens in a premature baby, because this surfactant is not made yet, the lungs really are one of the last to completely start, besides the nervous system and all that, but the lungs are one of the last organs to develop because the baby in utero is not breathing air. So a premature baby is not producing this surfactant yet. And so when he or she takes her first breath, that the lungs inflate with air. But then when they go to breathe out, the little alveoli, these little balls in there, the air sacs, if you will, hate using that term, but they, they collapse down on each other. And the little baby's respiratory muscles aren't strong enough to reinflate the alveoli so that the premature babies get put on the ventilators. Well, there's something called respiratory distress syndrome. And the respiratory distress syndrome happens in the premature babies when their alveoli can't reopen after they start to breathe. It's because they don't have this surfactant, right? So without that surfactant, babies have a hard time breathing. So you gotta put them on the ventilator. So that's what that RDS is right there. So these type two alveolar cells are important because they produce that surfactant secretion that prevents the alveoli from collapsing down on themselves when we breathe out. That's what that surfactant's used for. All right, so does anybody have any questions about type one, type two cells or the RDS, respiratory distress syndrome? All right, that's not too bad, huh? All right, let's get into how we control breathing and then the regulation of respiration. So breathing in and out, when you take air in your lungs, which is called you, you inhalation, you inhale, and then you breathe out, you exhale, that process is called pulmonary ventilation. Basically, you ventilate your lungs. The control center to regulate the rhythm of breathing and thus to alter or modify the rate and depth of breathing, those control centers are found in our brainstem. So in AMP1, you learned about the brainstem. If you remember the, the midbrain, the pons and the medulla oblongata, remember those? So the medulla oblongata, and the pons contain clusters of neurons and neuron cell bodies that their whole purpose is to regulate our rhythm and modifications of breathing. There's three basic areas of neurons, but we're really only going to learn the two. The two areas that I want you to know are called the DRG and the VRG. 
DRG stands for dorsal respiratory group. And the VRG is the ventral respiratory group. Both of these groups of neurons are found in the medulla oblongata. The DRG has the job of controlling what we call normal quiet breathing or tidal breathing. So what do I mean by that? Well, our normal quiet breathing is what you're pretty much doing right now. You're not thinking about breathing in, you're not thinking about breathing out very much air. It just a little bit goes in and a little bit comes out. I'm gonna tell you what the name of that volume of air is in a minute, but it's what we call our normal quiet breathing, which is much different than if you're working out, you're riding a bike or you're running, whatever the case may be, sooner or later you start breathing in deep and fast. So you actually change your breathing pattern. We change our breathing pattern depending on what you're doing. So obviously if you're not very physically active and you're just sitting down or lying down, you just have your normal quiet breathing pattern. You take some air in, you take, put, you know, exhale some air out. But then when you start getting more physically active or some other changes occur in the body, which I'm about to describe to you, you start breathing in faster and deeper, right? You can exhale more out as well. So we can have what's called a forced inhalation and a forced expiration. That's different from normal quiet breathing. So your everyday normal quiet breathing, the DRG is controlling that. However, when you start working out and running and or being physically uh, active, our ventral respiratory group can start to modify the DRG, meaning it can ultimately cause the DRG to make you inhale deeper and exhale more out. So the VRG is for a more increased inhalation and, a and an increased exhalation as when you're working out. The pontine group, which is the last one down here, somewhere in the bottom of the paragraph, you, you can read through that. It's also involved in helping in labored breathing events um, or when we have to change our breathing patterns due to sleep or speech. For instance, when you talk, you might take a breath in and then start talking, but you're not really taking another breath until you finish talking. All of a sudden you breathe in again. The pines, the pontine group helps control that. Instead of rhythmically breathing in and breathing out, which is the DRG. Consider what happens when you go to sleep as well. The muscles that regulate respiration patterns, breathing patterns are skeletal muscles, which means you have conscious control over them. So what happens? Why do we not stop breathing when we fall asleep? Because we're not conscious. Well, our pontine group aids in helping modify the DRG to make us breathe when we fall asleep or we go unconscious. So you don't just stop breathing. So any major change like that is regulated by the pontine group. So at least for the test, no DRG and the VRG, normal quiet breathing or when you're working out and you have to breathe deeper and harder is the VRG's response. Now, when do those neurons in the, in the VRG and in, in some cases the, the pontine group that's gonna help manipulate the DRG, how do those neurons in the medulla and the pons know when we're supposed to change our breathing pattern. In other words, how does our brain know if we're running on a treadmill and we have to breathe in deep and then breathe out more and breathe in more and breathe out more? How does, how does it know that? Well, there's a couple of ways that our control centers know to alter your rate and depth of breathing depending on what's going on in the body. And that has to do with 
receptors. So we talked about receptors briefly before, <clears throat> dealing with blood pressure and whatnot. And I may have mentioned the chemo receptors already, mentioned the proprio receptors already. We have to deal with them again. So right now what I wanna do is tell you what the chemo receptors do and where they're located. We have two areas where we have chemo receptors. Chemo receptors are receptors that have the job of monitoring chemical changes in the fluids in the body. Some of those chemo receptors are found in the central nervous system, specifically in the medulla oblongata, in which case we call them central chemo receptors. So the central chemoreceptors found in the medulla oblongata are responsible for monitoring chemical changes of cerebrospinal fluid. Specifically, the chemicals I'm referring to are hydrogen ions, their concentration, and how concentrated CO2 is, which is called the partial pressure, by the way. Partial pressure is the concentration or pressure of an individual gas. Um, you're gonna learn more about that in, your, in the lecture, but so the central chemoreceptors are gonna monitor the pH basically of, of cerebrospinal fluid and how much CO2 is in the cerebrospinal fluid. We have also peripheral chemoreceptors. The peripheral chemoreceptors actually monitor changes of hydrogen concentration, carbon dioxide, and oxygen in the blood. So the peripheral chemoreceptors are found in the arch of the aorta, so the aortic arch, and they're found in the carotid sinus. The peripheral chemoreceptors chemoreceptors actually monitor changes in all three of these chemicals. So in the blood, so they monitor how much oxygen we have in the blood. That's called the partial pressure of oxygen. What is the concentration of hydrogen in the blood that deals with pH? So what is the pH of the blood and how much CO2 is in the blood? So the peripheral chemoreceptors are monitoring that. The central chemoreceptors are monitoring hydrogen and CO2 and cerebrospinal fluid. So let me go, let me go over the importance of these chemicals, right? These gases and, and pH and give you a little scenario. So we have some normal physiological ranges of these substances in our blood. And like any other controlled condition in the body, you want them, uh-oh, can y'all still see my, um, the lab manual? Yeah. Yes. All right, very good. It said my session ended, I don't know why. Um, so like any other controlled condition in the body, you want, you don't wanna be too high, but you don't wanna be too low either. You wanna be right there in, in the middle. So we don't really want too much oxygen. You might think, why, why is having too much oxygen bad? Well, it is bad because too much oxygen can be toxic. If you put somebody uh, on oxygen and you have too much uh, high, higher concentration going into them than normal, you can make them go blind. Oxygen is actually deadly. So we don't want more oxygen than we need, but we don't want too little either, right? Everybody kind of knows you don't want too little. Um, so you don't want too much or too little of oxygen. You don't want your hydrogen ion concentration to go up too high. If hydrogen ion concentration goes up too high, that lowers your blood pH, which makes you acidic. And we don't wanna be acidic. Our regular blood pH has a range of 7.35 to 7.45. So we wanna be right there in the middle, or at least within the, that range. So if for some reason the hydrogen ion concentration went up too high, your pH would fall. And if it falls below 7.35, you then 
would have what's called respiratory acidosis if it's because of the, the respiratory system. And that causes some major problems in the body. Now it's beyond the scope of this little lecture to go into that because we have a whole lab on it. But ultimately we have to monitor that because if it does go up too much, that means something. On the other hand, if the hydrogen ion concentration fell too much, your pH would actually go up and you would become alkaline and it could go above 7.45. So we need to monitor how much hydrogen we have in solution in our blood so that we, we can regulate the respiratory system to help get rid of it or save some. And then how much CO2 is in the blood means something. We have a normal range for that. We don't want too much and we don't want too little. If we have too much CO2 building up in the blood, then our pH drops. Too much CO2 makes you have a low pH and you become acidic. If you don't have enough CO2 in the blood, if the, concentrate, if the partial pressure goes down, that means the pH would go up. So that's how you relate these things. And pH is gonna be a big one, by the way. So by regulating these chemicals in the blood and giving that information to the brainstem, to the medulla oblongata, the DRG and the VRG, we then know if we have to do our normal quiet breathing or if we have to breathe in deep and fast. So here's how it works. And I'll give you what I call the Tom Russell workout analogy to try and make it simple. When you start to work out, obviously your muscles need more oxygen because you're working out. So your cells start to take out more oxygen from the blood initially, so the partial pressure of oxygen starts to go down. Any tissue in the body that's metabolically active produces more acids than bases, so the hydrogen ion concentration starts to go up. And any metabolically active tissue performing aerobic respiration a lot to make ATP makes a lot of CO2. So the partial pressure of CO2 goes up. So look what happens if your O2 goes down, your hydrogen ion concentration goes up. Oh, and that's what these little brackets mean, by the way. That means the concentration of hydrogen. So O2 goes down, hydrogen concentration goes up, and PCO2 goes up. That happens when you're working out or your tissue is metabolically active. So when we don't have enough oxygen, our brain thinks, hey, we need to breathe in more oxygen. So you start to breathe faster and deeper to, to load more oxygen in the blood. When the hydrogen ion concentration goes up and the partial pressure of CO2 goes up, the pH of the blood goes down and you become acidic. So when the fluids become acidic, that is a strong signifier to the brainstem to tell you to breathe deeper and faster. The easiest way to explain why that happens is this. If you have too much CO2 in your blood because your muscles are working out, we need to get rid of it. You don't want it to build up in your blood. So how do you get rid of it? You start breathing faster and deeper to help get rid of that extra CO2. So by getting rid of that extra CO2, your CO2 starts to come down. It ultimately also makes your hydrogen ion concentration start to come down. I'm gonna show you a chemical reaction of that in a minute, but it'll start bringing all of these chemical uh, controlled conditions back to normal. Another easy way to explain this scenario if CO2 is building up in your blood and why you wanna breathe is this. I'm sure you've at some point in your life tried to hold your breath as long as you can. And sooner or later, when you hold your breath as long as you can, you start getting this burning sensation in your gut to breathe. You wanna open your mouth and go and start breathing again. Well, a lot of people think that that feeling that you get to, that you wanna breathe is because you're running out of oxygen. And that's wrong. There's still a lot of oxygen actually left in your blood when you get that feeling that you wanna breathe. 
But what is happening when you're holding your breath and not exhaling out is you're not getting rid of the CO2 that all the cells are making. And so the CO2 builds up in the blood. So when CO2 builds up in the blood, your blood pH becomes acidic. And that acid environment causes a strong response from the VRG and the DRG to make you inhale and exhale deeper and faster. So you start going <sighs> after you hold your breath a while. That's mainly because you became acidic. So by holding your breath, what you're really doing is you're inducing a temporary respiratory acidosis. That's what you're doing. And when you become acidic, those neurons in the brainstem are strongly stimulated to make you breathe. So pH is a big one. All right, so that's what the chemoreceptors are doing. They're monitoring all of this to try and make sure you have enough oxygen, that your hydrogen ion concentration and your CO2 levels are in a normal range. If they're higher than normal and your O2 is lower than normal, that means you have to breathe in deeper and faster because you're working out. And I could just easily reverse this. What if we have a lot of O2 in the blood and we don't have enough hydrogen in the blood and we don't have enough CO2 in the blood? Hydrogen is low, CO2 is low. You know in, in, uh, what can cause that condition? Hyperventilation. People that hyperventilate. When you start to hyperventilate, you're getting rid of too much CO2 because you're exhaling too much of it out. And that leads to a higher blood pH than normal, which would be called respiratory alkalosis. And ultimately, it can give you a slight headache and all of that. I don't know if you ever hyperventilated before. You get kind of dizzy and you get lightheaded. That's because you're changing your blood pH. It's actually going up. <coughs> all right, excuse me. All right, so those are the chemoreceptors. They monitor chemistry. What about the proprioceptors? If you remember those, the proprioceptors are found in and around the joints of the body. And so our brain also knows when we need to breathe in deeper and faster because our, our brain knows when your arms and legs are moving. How does, it, how does our brain know when our arms and legs are moving? Like if you're running or you're lifting weights or something like that relative to as if you're just lying down on a couch or something is because of what we call proprioception. The proprioceptors monitor joint movement. And so when you start to move your arms and legs and your basically your joints are moving, then your brain is signified to the fact that you're active. And when you become active, it increases your respiratory rate. So that's one reason why when you start running on a treadmill, you start breathing in faster, all right? So we monitor the chemistry and we monitor body movement. Chemoreceptors for chemistry, proprioceptors for body movement. All right, so does anybody have any questions about this before I leave it? I'm gonna get back to this chemistry again in a, in a second, not to go into a whole lot more detail, but I wanna show you a picture in one of the PowerPoints that I usually use in lecture which the pictures are in your lecture book as well. All right, so the next thing that we have to get into is how do we transport the respiratory gases around the body? So I'll have a couple of questions about uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide transport for the physiology portion of the test. <coughs> so let's go back over that. Sorry, my throat's kind of dry. All right, so in erythrocytes, red blood cells, we have hemoglobin. You guys remember that? Hemoglobin carries the majority of all of the oxygen around the body. About 98 to 98 and a half percent of all the oxygen that's transported and delivered around the body is bound to the iron in the heme group of hemoglobin. So, uh, the reason why we need iron in our diet is to make hemoglobin. An iron ion is what holds on to the oxygen molecule as it's being transported around the body. 
So when we load the blood up with oxygen as we inhale, the majority of all of the oxygen goes into the red blood cell and is bound to hemoglobin. And when hemoglobin is fully saturated with oxygen, because each hemoglobin can carry four oxygen molecules, when it's completely bound with oxygen, it's called oxyhemoglobin. When some of the oxygen is delivered to the cells in the body, and thus oxygen is unloaded from hemoglobin, we call it deoxyhemoglobin. So oxyhemoglobin, hemoglobin is loaded with oxygen, and deoxyhemoglobin is where at least one or more of the oxygen molecules has been unloaded or dissociated from hemoglobin. But what happens to the other one to one and a half percent of the oxygen that's being loaded in the blood as we breathe in? Well, that one and a half percent of oxygen goes into plasma and stays dissolved in the water in the plasma. And the reason why this is such a low percentage is because oxygen does not like to stay dissolved in water. It has a very low solubility coefficient, by the way. And that's why if you have a fish tank, you have to have an aerator in it. It'll keep bubbling oxygen into the water. If you turned your filter and your aerator off, sooner or later, the oxygen is going to dissociate and dissipate from that water, and then your fish are going to die, at least the ones that have a high oxygen demand. So we have to constantly, for our fish, load the oxygen into water. Well, for that reason, since oxygen does not like to stay dissolved in water, only a small percentage stays dissolved in plasma. That's why the majority of it is bound to hemoglobin, all right? All right, so that's how we transport oxygen around the body. It's on hemoglobin and just a little bit in the plasma. But what about the CO2? So, Carbon dioxide is our waste respiratory gas. Many of you may have forgotten where CO2 actually comes from, but I'll tell you this. Every single cell in your body, except for mature red blood cells, perform aerobic respiration to make ATP. And you learned about that way back in general biology. Seems like a lifetime ago, right? And so the waste product, one of the waste products of aerobic respiration to make ATP is carbon dioxide. The other one is water. But carbon dioxide is made by all those cells in the body that are making ATP aerobically. And where does all that carbon dioxide go? Well, all of those cells dump their CO2 into the blood. So what happens when the CO2 gets dumped into the blood? Where does it go? How is it transported? Well, this way. 7% of all the CO2 stays dissolved in the plasma. Now, it has a little bit higher of a solubility coefficient than oxygen. That's why a little bit more can stay dissolved in plasma. But even this is kind of low. These gases don't like to stay dissolved in, in water. And I, I can give you a, a, a good analogy for that to prove it to you. Everybody has opened up a two liter Coke before. As soon as you open that, that uh, cap, it goes So that noise you hear is a gassing off of CO2. It comes out of solution. The only reason why it was still in solution is because when that was product was made, it was made under pressure. And so if we change pressure, you can force a gas to stay dissolved in, in fluid. So at this point, that's neither here nor there. You just need to know this little bit amount stays dissolved in the plasma. But what happens to the other 93% of all the CO2? Well, it goes straight into the red blood cell. So 7% stays dissolved in plasma and flows around the body in the plasma. 93% goes into the red blood cell. Now, 23% of that 93% combines to hemoglobin. I'll say it again. 23% of that CO2 entering the red blood cell 
combines to hemoglobin, albeit it's not on the iron like oxygen, it binds to the protein portion of hemoglobin. And when that happens, the hemoglobin is called carbaminohemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin, that's how you say that. So hemoglobin actually transports oxygen around the body for us, and it transports a little bit of the CO2 around the body for us. I may not have, had to have told you, but it also transports nitric oxide around the body, which is a vasodilator. But ultimately, oxygen and CO2 can, can be carried by hemoglobin, although not at the same spot on the molecule. Now, the majority of all of that 93%, which is the last 70% of all the CO2 being transported in the body, is inside the red blood cell. It is inside the red blood cell. And once it goes into the red blood cell, it is actually converted into bicarbonate through this reaction that you see right here. So when the CO2 goes into the red blood cell, it combines with water and in the presence of the enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, the CA right here is carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase converts CO2 and water to carbonic acid, H2CO3. Now some of this carbonic acid is broken down into hydrogen, and bicarbonate. And this reaction is reversible. So as CO2 is entering the red blood cell under high concentration, high partial pressure, the reaction is gonna run in the right-handed direction. Bicarbonate is then gonna leave the red blood cell to re-enter plasma. And so the majority of all of the CO2 that's being transported in the blood is transported in the form of HCO3 minus. This is a bicarbonate ion. So what I wanna do right now is pull up this picture from your lecture book and teach you a little bit about from the picture the words that I'm using, hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. So what you see here at the top of this picture, this is the blood, obviously the cardiovascular system, some capillaries around the alveoli of the lung. This represents the alveolar sac. Each little bitty ball that you see represents the alveoli. And this is the deepest part of our lung where we have the majority of gas exchange. So when you breathe air in, you inhale, you know that you want oxygen to be loaded in the blood. We already know that. You wanna load the blood up with oxygen. And then you know that when we exhale, we wanna unload CO2 from the blood into the lungs and exhale that CO2 out to get rid of it. So, when oxygen gets loaded in the blood, only one and a half percent stays dissolved in the plasma and circulates around the body in plasma. The other 98 and a half percent actually enters the erythrocyte, combines with hemoglobin, which is abbreviated HB. And when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, it's called oxyhemoglobin. Now, at the same time, we have carbon dioxide leaving the blood and entering the lung so we can exhale it out. Now, about 7% of that CO2 that was loaded in the blood by all the cells just dissolves from the plasma, gets into the alveoli, so we can exhale it out. About 23% of that CO2 was bound to hemoglobin. This is called carbaminohemoglobin. So that CO2 dissociates from hemoglobin and goes into the lung at 23% and we exhale it out. Now, the only thing I don't like about this picture is they show bicarbonate right here going straight from the blood and into the lung, but that doesn't happen. Bicarbonate has to re-enter that red blood cell, which I'm gonna show you in a second, and is then reconverted back into CO2 
And then that 70% of CO2 goes into the lung. So that's that chemistry I'm about to show you. It's called the carbonic acid cycle. So I'm gonna go over that again in a second. So then the blood goes back to the left side of the heart from the lung. If you remember the blood flow through the heart we already covered, oxy oxy oxygenated blood goes to the left side from the aorta back out to the body. Now, that oxygenated blood, the oxygen is gonna go from the blood to our body cells. So one and a half percent comes directly out of that dissolved plasma. The other 98.5% comes from oxyhemoglobin. So it leaves a red blood cell and then diffuses out to the body cells. From the cells in the body, producing CO2 is a waste product of ATP formation. 7% stays dissolved in plasma. 23% combines with hemoglobin called carbamine hemoglobin. And the other 70% is converted to bicarbonate although it doesn't go directly into the blood as bicarbonate. It goes into the red blood cell first. So I'm about to show you that chemistry. But before I do that, I have to give you the names of the gas exchange that occurs up here and the gas exchange that occurs down here. So when we have the exchange of respiratory gases between the lungs and the blood, that's called external respiration. I'll say it again. The exchange of gases, oxygen and CO2, between the lungs and the blood and back and forth is called external respiration. The exchange of gases between the blood and the body cells is called internal respiration internal respiration. So let me show you another picture that's in your book, the lecture book, <clears throat> that shows the chemistry a little bit better of what I'm referring to. And one reason why I like to cover this a little bit more detail than what they show in the lab manual is because we're going to return to this chemistry. This exact chemical reaction is going to be involved in pH regulation when we do acid-base balance. <clears throat> so what are we looking at here? Well, first of all, this is a red blood cell is greatly enlarged. So it's flowing obviously in the blood vessel capillary. Let's say this is a capillary, blood capillary on this side. Here's the plasma out here, the blood cell over here. Now the top picture, this blood capillary would be along the alveolus. So that would be what's called the alveolar capillary. And then you have the alveolus. Down here, we have the capillary around our tissue. So we have the blood, blood plasma, and our tissue cell. So the exchange of gases between the tissue cells in the blood is called internal respiration. The exchange of gases between the blood and the alveolus of the lungs is called external respiration. So let's look at what happens and let's start with internal respiration. So you know you want your body cells to get oxygen. We already know that. So all of the oxygen that's being transported by the blood is going to want to go into the body cells so they could use it for aerobic respiration. So about 98.5% of all of the oxygen being transported is bound to hemoglobin. So hemoglobin and oxygen will dissociate. I'll tell you why later, although you can see here an acidic environment makes more oxygen be unloaded from hemoglobin. But oxygen will dissociate from hemoglobin, 98.5% coming from within the red blood cell to the body cell. The other 1.5%, which we don't see, is just in the plasma would go into the body cell, right? Now the body cells performing aerobic respiration and it's producing CO2 as a waste respiratory gas and CO2 is gonna be uh, dis, uh, diffusing from the body cell ultimately into the blood. About 7% of that CO2 will stay dissolved in plasma and just flow along in the plasma. 93% of that CO2 is gonna enter the erythrocyte. 
23% of that goes and binds to hemoglobin to form carbamine hemoglobin. The other 70% of carbon dioxide, which is the majority of all of it, enters into this very important chemical reaction. So CO2, 70% of it combines with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, and it forms an acid called carbonic acid, H2CO3. Carbonic acid dissociates into bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, it's an anion, and a cation, hydrogen ion. So that bicarbonate basically is carrying our CO2. Notice we have CO3 on the end. So there's a CO2 buried in here. So that bicarbonate, then once it's produced, will leave the red blood cell and re-enter the plasma. Now it doesn't go directly across the plasma membrane like that. There's actually a protein transporter because no ion can cross the plasma membrane on its own. There's a, a protein transporter that tran is called an exchanger. It, it transports one bicarbonate out, in this case, and one chloride ion in. So at internal respiration, the direction of this chemical reaction is to the right because we have a whole bunch of CO2. The, the direction at which this reaction runs depends on the concentration of CO2 relative to the concentration of bicarbonate. So at, since at internal respiration we have more CO2, the reaction runs to the right and we liberate high, uh, bicarbonate, which then leaves the red blood cell for exchange of a chloride ion. This is important. One bicarbonate comes out, one chloride goes in, that's called the chloride shift. The chloride shift at internal respiration is into the red blood cell. Now that chloride shift is gonna be reversed at external respiration, which I'll show you in a second, right? So bicarbonate now is flowing in the blood, in the plasma. As this blood flows back up to the right side of the heart and then ultimately back to the lungs, specifically in the pulmonary capillaries, we then want to load the blood with oxygen, which is a, the reverse direction as we saw down here. We wanna unload oxygen to the cells at internal respiration, but at external respiration, we wanna load the blood up with oxygen. So oxygen will go from the lungs, the alveolus, into the blood cell. Now, one and a half percent of that stays dissolved in the plasma. The other 98 and a half percent enters the red blood cell, combines with hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is a, one of the protein buffering systems, so it can buffer hydrogen ions. And that's why you see hydrogen on here. That means that, that hemoglobin is acidic. It's soaking up that hydrogen that's, that's being released from carbonic acid. So it can buffer that acid. So when oxygen comes in, the hydrogen is kicked off. And at inter external respiration, the bicarbonate goes back into the red blood cell for exchange of a chloride ion. So one bicarbonate goes in, one chloride leaves, and that's what we call the reversal of the chloride shift. So this is one reason that chloride ions in the blood are important for respiratory physiology to occur correctly. If we had too little or too much of this, this process would not happen appropriately. But we have enough chloride in the blood, we can exchange it for bicarbonate. That's one of the roles of chloride. So that's called the chloride shift. It's to the inside of the red blood cell at internal respiration, is to the outside of the red blood cell at external respiration, and that's how you're gonna remember that. Chloride goes external during external respiration. Chloride goes internal during internal respiration, all right? The chloride shift. So what happens when bicarbonate enters the red blood cell? Well, it recombines with hydrogen to form, because it's gonna to run to the left, 
to form carbonic acid, H2CO3, which in the presence of carbonic anhydrase splits up into water and CO2. And so CO2 is going to be unloaded from hemoglobin, carbamine hemoglobin. CO2 is going to be uh, regenerated from bicarbonate in a carbonic acid equation. And that carbon dioxide goes into the lungs and you exhale it out. Right? Now, <clears throat> this reaction is important to help regulate our pH in our blood. I don't want to get into all of that now, but just in case, uh, I'll, I'll give you a slight introduction to it. When you hold your breath and you're not in this process, you're not unloading CO2 into the lung and exhaling it out. When you hold your breath and CO2 keeps getting dumped into the blood at internal respiration and you're not getting rid of it because you're holding your breath or you might have a patient that's not breathing. They might have hit their head or something and they're not breathing. CO2 keeps getting loaded up into the blood because the cells in the body don't know you're holding your breath and the cells in the body don't know that you're not breathing if you're knocked out or something, like if somebody damaged the medulla, if they hit the back of their head or something. So CO2 keeps going in the blood and look what happens. The more CO2 we get, the more this reaction runs to the right. And if the reaction runs to the right, look what you liberate. Hydrogen. The more hydrogen you keep making means the hydrogen ion concentration keeps getting higher. That makes your blood pH fall, which is respiratory acidosis. And that's going to cause a lot of issues. So if someone's respiratory system is working correctly and they, their blood pH does fall because there's too much hydrogen in the blood, then what happens? The chemoreceptors trigger the DRG and the BRG to make you breathe in deeper and harder and faster. So you start exhaling more CO2 out. The more CO2 you exhale out, you make the reaction run to the left as an external respiration. So look what happens when the reaction runs to the left. Hydrogen is being removed as it's combining with bicarbonate, reforming carbonic acid, which is broken up into water and CO2, what, in which you're, you're exhaling the CO2 out. So technically, as you exhale CO2 out, you're getting rid of acid out of the blood. So by respiring faster than normal, you can raise your blood pH back up to normal if you are acidic. So that's just a, a brief introduction in what, into what we're going to be getting into. We're not getting into that yet, but we'll be getting into it uh, when we get into the acid-base balance. All right, so does anybody have any questions about how we transport the gases in the blood? No? All right. Well, the last thing that I need to talk about then are lung volumes which if you scroll down in your chapter, you come across this. This is a, a diagram, a tracing, if you will, of a person's lung volumes that have been measured by a, by a machine called a spirometer. The tracing that you see of the changes in lung volume is called a spirogram, the graph. So, you need to know what these lung volumes are, and we have, we have to know how to calculate some other lung volumes. So is everybody still able to see my screen? Yes. All right, very good. Yes. Thank you. All right, so before I get into what the lung volumes are, whenever I start this section, I always want to make sure that students know how to convert liters to milliliters and milliliters to liters. Because at this point in your career as a biology student, a and P student, you may have forgotten. The last time you see that is in general biology, I believe. So in order to convert liters to milliliters and back and forth, 
you have to know which direction to move your decimal place. So let's look at this number right here, for instance. 3,100 milliliters. If you know there are a thousand milliliters in one liter, how many liters do you think is made up by 3,100 milliliters? Three and like some chains or something like that. Shouldn't it be about three? It's about three, but it's a little more than three. What is it? Uh, 3.1. Very good. It's 3.1 liters. Because let's face it, if we only had 1,000 milliliters right here, you would have one liter, right? So how can you determine that if you didn't know that, by the way? Well, when you're going from this small unit to a large unit, milliliters is a small unit, liter is a larger unit. When you're going from milliliters to liters, you move your decimal place three places to the left. So to get 3.1, and I, I could just look at it and know it's 3.1, but if you didn't, all you have to do is move your decimal place. One, two, three, and you would have 3.1 liters. So 3,100 milliliters is 3.1 liters. All right. Now, what about 1,900 milliliters? How many liters is that? 1.9. Very good. 1.9. All I do is move my decimal place three places. One, two, three to the left, and I would have 1.9. Now, if I had, if I said I have 1.2 liters, and you needed to know how to make that into milliliters. All you do is you take your decimal place and you move it three places to the right. So when you're going from liters to milliliters, you move your decimal place to the right. So if I had 1.2 liters, that would be one, two, three. That would be 1,200 milliliters. That's how you do it. All right. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that is some of the numbers on the test may be in mils or in liters. So you have to know the conversion between them. So let me go over some of these values and see what we're looking at here on this, on this graph. So a spirometer is a machine that you breathe in and out of, and it, it measures a volume of air that you inhale and or exhale. And if you are breathing normally during what's called normal quiet breathing, you would have a measurement of on average 350 to 600 mils of air, milliliters of air volume going in and out of your lung. It depends on your body size, right? Shorter people, have lower lung volumes than taller people, right? Not necessarily weight. I'm talking about your body size, but not weight. So bigger people, body size wise, have larger lungs than smaller people. I mean, that's pretty common sense. Babies have tiny lungs compared to you. So a baby's lung volume is much smaller than the adult lung volume. Well, adults have different body sizes as well. And so their lung volumes all change. And typically, males have larger lung volumes than females of comparable size. Now, if you have a female that's really big and a small male, that's different. I'm not talking about that. So on average, we have what we call tidal volume at about 500 milliliters, right? So in the very middle of this chart, you see the change in volume. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, right? If we breathe in and we breathe out, how much air are we breathing in and breathing out if we're not thinking about breathing? If we're just sitting there quietly doing our thing, we're not running on a treadmill. Well, that's called your tidal volume, your TV, 
your tidal volume. And the tidal volume on average is about 500 milliliters of air that you bring in and out. Breathe in 500, exhale out 500. Inhale 500 milliliters, exhale 500 milliliters. Give or take a little bit. It depends if you're male or female and your body size, not weight. Obese people and very skinny people, the weight doesn't change a lung volume. It's your body size and height that changes that. All right, so that's called your tidal volume. Now, if I hooked you up to this machine and I told you to breathe in normally and exhale normally without trying to breathe, I would measure your tidal volume. All of a sudden right here, I would say, okay, breathe in normally, but as you're breathing in normally, I want you to try and breathe in as much air as you can. Like try to force as much air as you can in on one inhalation. After a normal exhalation, you just breathe out normally. And then all of a sudden try to breathe in as much air as possible. That's called your inspiratory reserve volume or the IRV. So if you just exhale normally, but then inhale as hard as you can, you would get what's called your inspiratory reserve volume. That's the maximal amount of air that you can inhale after a normal inhalation. It's called the IRV. Now, if I told you to exhale out, and I know they show it off of this IRV coming down, but normally what you do is once that happens, you make the, the patient breathe in and out normally again for a little bit, and you start to get a normal rhythm of tidal volume again. So <clears throat> if I had the patient breathe in normal, exhale normal, breathe in normal, but now on that next exhalation, try to breathe out as hard as you can. That's what's represented by this part of the graph right here. So if you try to breathe out as hard as you can after a normal exhalation, that's called the expiratory reserve volume or the ERV, expiratory reserve volume. Now, these three volumes that I just mentioned, the tidal volume or the TV, the IRV, which is the maximum amount of air that you can in inhale in over a normal inhalation, and the ERV are the three lung volumes that we are actually measuring on the spirometer. Now, you measure these three lung volumes on the spirometer, and then you can calculate these capacities, inspiratory capacity, vital capacity, total lung capacity, and what's called a functional residual capacity. By knowing these three values, you can calculate these other capacities. Now, I want to show you something on this graph before I show you the formulas, because people kind of, oh, the form they hate formulas. Look at this graph shows you pretty much everything you need to know. What is the TV? Well, it's, it's only between these two lines. What is the IRV? Well, it's only between this line and this line. And what is the ERV? Well, it's the volume between this line and this line. Now look at your capacities. For instance, look at your inspiratory capacity. The inspiratory capacity, by the way, is the total amount of volume of air that you can inhale in. And that's it. It's called the inspiratory capacity. So the total volume of air that I can inhale in can only be made up of how much I can inhale normally, which is the TV, plus my reserve volume which is the IRV. And look at the inspiratory capacity. The inspiratory capacity is only the IRV plus the TV. And that's it. 
you add these two volumes up and you get the inspiratory capacity. Now, what about vital capacity or the VC? Vital capacity is the total volume of air that you can maximally inhale and maximally exhale. So basically, that's the total volume of air that you could bring in and then out of your lungs during a respiratory cycle. So what does that entail? Well, it involves the IRV, because obviously I can inhale all that in, the TV, and the expiratory reserve volume, the ERV. So these lines show you what you have to add together in order to get that capacity, in other words. So vital capacity is the IRV plus the TV plus the ERV, so forth and so on. Now, to calculate the other two capacities, I have to tell you about the residual volume. The residual volume is the volume of air, which in fact doesn't change through your life, by the way. Your lung volumes can change. That residual volume <coughs> remains there from the time of birth, from the time you took your first breath. <coughs> and so that residual volume is the volume of air that ma is maintained within the respiratory system. The only way you could get that volume of air out is if your entire system of alveoli and tubes in your respiratory system collapse down on each other. And that doesn't happen. So there's a small amount of air that remains in your system, maintaining the openness of your alveoli and the bronchial tubes everywhere. That's called the residual volume. Now on average for the adult male, it's about 1200 mils. And for the female, adult female, it's about 1100, right? Now you don't have to go in and memorize these values. I'm gonna make up some numbers for that for you to make the math easy. But the reason why I had to tell you about residual volume is because residual volume is involved in calculating what's called the functional residual capacity or the FRC and the total lung capacity. So the functional residual capacity is going to be the volume of air that you can maximally exhale out plus the residual volume. So that is the ERV plus the RV. So how do you know how to do that as well? Not just by memorizing that formula. It's on this chart. The functional residual capacity is the ERV plus the residual volume. Same thing with the total lung volume. The total lung volume basically is vital capacity. The IRV, the TV, and the ERV. But you have to add to that the residual volume. So IRV, TV, ERV, and residual volume is the total lung capacity. So these capacities have these formulas that you have to go and learn. The volumes are the, the volumes that we measure. So I would have to give you this data. I would say, okay, we measured somebody's TV at, I don't know, 200 milliliters or whatever. I'm gonna make up some numbers. You know, and the IRV is whatever. What is the inspiratory capacity? And you have to know, you have to add those two numbers together, right? So that's it for spirometry. I want you to understand this graph a little bit. I'm not putting a picture of the graph on the test. I like teaching from it to show you what each volume is represented by, all right? <clears throat>